Hello, you're welcome to another edition of Straight Talk, your non-diplomatic talk show. Yeah, we say just the way it is, no matter whose ox is gone. I have with me today an interesting personality, a Nobel laureate, and also a playwright, a poet, a social critic. At one time in the political history of Nigeria, he founded a political party. I'm talking about Professor Wale Soyinka. So you're welcome to my talk. Thank you. Do. Thank you. Well, Pro let me ask you this: Does it does it uh, sometimes um, bother you that you are an African? Uh, if, if we take a look at the the extent of leadership and and the corruption in Africa, does it bother you that as a black man that your continent is still finding it difficult to have leaders that that can inspire? Well, when you talk about as an African, there's corruption everywhere. Uh, we talk. We spoke about pension scheme just now. Uh, I remember my reaction some years ago, about 10, 15 years ago, when I believe it was Citibank lost the pension uh, funds of a lot of Americans to corrupt uh, um, employees or managers or directors. I was appalled. I could not be, I, I thought it was the most criminal uh, thing any human being could do to another. If you take the funds an individual has saved, has worked for all his or her life, on which that individual is relying when he gets old and useless, unable to be productive anymore, and people actually sat, conspired, and made away with billions of that fund. I, I felt that those people should not just be shot, but should be shot piecemeal, beginning from the toes all the way up. I'm not bloody thirsty, but, but I'm telling you the way I felt. It, it, it just seemed to me, you're taking, you're making nonsense of the life, the entire life of an individual. So when the pension fund the scandal broke here, I said, ah, here we go. We always imitate the worst things going on elsewhere in the world. And in China, they're still executing people for corruption. Uh, take England, the scandal, the Bofors gone uh, scandal, for instance, in which people were actually making money from those who are considered the enemies, the national enemies of, uh, of, uh, of Great Britain. Go to France. Look at the former Italian uh, uh, president, Berlusconi, and so on. Everywhere. However, Nigeria, I'm afraid, the case is different. In most other places that I know, there is already a project on. Uh, there's an opportunity. There's a system, there's a trade, there's a function, you know. And people then say, ah, I, I can steal some of this. I can divert these funds. In Nigeria, very often, it's like people sit together and they say, what project can we think of from which, <laughs> whose money, whose funds we can take away? So white elephants are created, totally vaporous, you know, non-existent projects are created specifically for crop. Now, now, do you put this blame at the doorstep of leadership or followership? Because we, we operate in a democracy. Both, both. Because if there's, if, if there's a collective will of the people, uh, corruption will be diminished to, I, I would not say a tolerable <laughs> level, uh, no, because that, there's no level which is the only level of corruption tolerable is zero. Uh, but uh, far too many, uh, too, uh, too great a proportion of followership says, well, what the hell? Can't beat them? Let's join them. But the primary, the primary uh, culprit is leadership. And sometimes even the very system throws up, you know, system for which you fought can throw up, ironically, corrupt, you know, corrupt practices. The way we practice democracy in this country, for instance, just throws the door wide open for corruption. So what will you advocate? Is it to have our own type of democracy? Or? Um, well, the different kinds of democracy, you, you know that. Well, correction, because very often we hear things like African democracy, African mm -hmm. uh, democracy for me means uh, accountability, it means uh, uh, the, the, 
according the right of choice to people to, choose, to you know, pick their own leaders, etc., etc., uh, openness, participation, and so on. Once those principles are observed, then you can have variations of ways of getting there uh, to the democratic Valhalla. But the, the method of getting there, that can be problematic. The presidential system is most open to corruption. That's where you have pork barrel schemes, and that's where, you, and in Nigeria uh, case in particular, which has fashioned its own method of the presidential method of democracy, mm. we really taken the negative possibilities, we really maximize the potential, beginning with the legislatures. You say what you like today. There is no way that a nation can live with the salaries, paying the salaries and allowances that we do today to yes. legislatures. So what is the way forward? Because that is the way it is in the constitution. We need this bicameral system of legislature. Now, if we're saying that no nation can live paying this kind of salaries, how do we move forward as a country? Uh, why else do you think that uh, many people shout, let us sit down and evolve a constitution ourselves? Because this is not our constitution. This is not a people's constitution. This constitution was imposed on the nation by the military. And even after, when Nigerians had the first election, they, did, they never did see the constitution. Neither the candidates, nor those who voted for the candidates. But because of the general anxiety, the general will, uh, to just get rid of the military, so they go away, and then the civilians can come together and decide eventually what kind of constitution they would like. That's why many people decided to go in the majority. You're talking about the sovereign national conference? You're talking about. I'm talking about national conference with or without the sovereign. No, is, it, is, it, is it practicable? Hmm? Can it's it be practicable, possible? yes. When you have elected, ofi uh, elected officials at the national assembly? Yes, it's happened before in other places. Yes, it's possible. And you can, even if you decide you don't want, uh, uh, you cannot have a sovereign national conference, and you can. Even if you decide you cannot have a national conference, and you can, nothing stops you from having a genuine constitutional conference. But what has been going on? You know, we're running a centralist constitution here. And centralism is on the furthest negative side of the democratic principle. Federalism is closer, you know, definitely much closer. We're not practicing federal democracy at the moment. We're still practicing virtually a militarist constitution. The military on leaving implanted their people all over the place. In parastatals, many of them, you look at the Senate today, and I've said this before, many of them never won an election in all their lives. So we don't even have lead leaders of our choice. They were imposed on us by the military. And, and the people also participated in allowing this to be imposed? When uh, the military had been, you know, expelled. That was the time now for civilians to come together and say, okay, we have added four more years to military rule. Now, during these four years, let us all come together and decide exactly how we would like to be ruled. Let the voice of the people be heard. And the military knew what they were doing. You know, they knew what they were doing. And right now, we're still saddled with militarist mentality. Sent but let me take you to this. I remember you, you, you founded the political party Democratic Front for People's Federation. I, I guess it was because of this passion that, look, we need to effect change in the system. I'd hoped to create a movement, not so much a political party, but a movement on whose platform there will be rallying up to the point where there will be a constitutional conference. In addition, no, I... Uh, I felt that it's, I, I, I'm essentially a teacher. I felt that I could influence and teach a young generation uh, to understand that they need not accept the status quo, that they can actually undermine an existing system. I wanted a party you know, whose membership will go from door to door on bicycles, ride donkeys if never necessary, ride, uh, be pushed where they cannot walk in Omalanke door to door knocking and saying this is the manifesto and this is this is uh, this is how we intend to proceed we don't have in fact we the other name for the dfpf was the zero cobalt party 
I'm proud of it. But the forces which militated against you know, this, this movement are absolutely incredible. And part of that, part of the forces, uh, can be described as what we talk, spoke about earlier, the problem of followership. That uh, many who rallied to the flag, to the, to the banner, um, couldn't believe it on discovering that we had no money. They just could not. So money is very significant. Money is still very significant to lots of people. But listen, I was talking to president, former um, uh, president uh, of Brazil just uh, last uh, week or so ago, President Lula, uh, Lula da Silva. And we were talking about politics and how grassroots movement, you know, he was a labor leader. And he described to me a process that took 20 years. He said it took him 20 years from the moment when he stood outside and went from door to door, said, my name is Lula da Silva, and I'm proposing to you, you know, and that's how he started. It took him 20 years, but he stuck to it. He stuck with it and eventually became president of Brazil. So you see, it can be done. But Nigerians, I'm afraid, many people still want quick results. You cannot get quick results. So, so, so how long is it going to take prof to, 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 to stand for an elected position? Look, I'm, not, I'm not involved. If, if, if those that are involved are not doing it the way you expect that it should be done, wouldn't it be right that you also stand for election and try to... No, no, no. I, I, I will never stand for election on the platform of a party which I formed. Because then that means I'm just interested in power. I would never dream for one single moment. The few times I've actually seriously considered standing for election, and the period lasted very, very short, I must confess. Those few times have been when I've been invited by some political parties to stand on their platform. I, I couldn't possibly, I couldn't even dream of creating a party for myself. No, no, if you are invited now, you will stand. Uh, it's too late now, you know. I, I'm, devoting, I'm devoting my time. I've spent so much time on uh, and energy in uh, those directions. I want to spend a little time on the arts. Mm. Uh, okay, let, let, let me take you back to something we talked about, but uh, uh, talking about corruption. Uh, 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 just recently, the, the Nigerian president pardoned uh, a former uh, uh, state governor that was convicted for such his time, and uh, a lot of people said it's, it's wrong. Now, why should the government do that? And some persons also explained that this man has been sentenced, he has had his time, what else do you want? If he is pardoned, is that not the essence of it to, to absorb him back to the society? What is your take on this? Well, let me begin by saying that it's very interesting how the issues have been confused uh, by some apologists for, the, uh, for this pardon, saying it's within the president's constitutional right, he didn't do anything wrong. That's not the, that has never been the issue. The issue is, as you put it, by one side, that when someone has committed a crime on that level, you know, on that level, very, very close to running away with the pension scheme, and you run away with the, with, the, with the resources of the people, which are required to develop the people, to develop schools, health, uh, you, you inflict, uh, and shelter, and so on and so forth, you inflict an enormous injury on people. And that, uh, the, um, the restitution does not end there with simply serving a short prison sentence and forfeiting some of, the, uh, uh, some of your stolen property. That is, the, that, is the, that is at the core of people's resentment. And in addition, when you're placed in a position of trust, trust is very important. It means you have betrayed the trust of the people. And from that point of view, it's the people who can forgive you. Now, it's interesting, however, that some of the people from that area over whom he ruled are saying that the president was quite in order. Being governor in one state uh, doesn't uh, excise that state out of the, total, the totality. You were a governor under a particular constitution. You breached that constitution. You breached the law, which brings all of us together under one umbrella. And so we, the rest, also have a voice about it. And my view was that it was the most insensitive decision. And when you take that in conjunction with light prison sentences, you know, derisive 
uh, prison sentences, as in the case of the pension scheme. And then you try to mix that up with uh, those who are victims of political you know, persecution under a dictatorship. That is trivializing the whole meaning of crime and punishment. It, it, it is really trying to bamboozle uh, a nation. There's so many untidy and unseemly aspects about that pardon. And those who say, they, you know, it's okay, that's their view. But the rest of us must exercise our right to express our own view. Okay, thank you so much. Let's go on break now. When we'll come back, we'll still be talking about some other uh, international issues. Please stay with us. Yeah, welcome back. Now, if you're just joining us, I've been speaking with Professor Wale Shoinka. And uh, let me go back to this other uh, issue, the Boko Haram. That the, let me just say the insurgency issue in Africa generally. Why do you think we have this spate of insurgency in Africa at this material time of our history? Well, first of all, we've been very lucky so far. Religi religious extremism of the violent kind is nothing new to the world, to the world community. The seeds have been here for quite a while. And as I stated in an interview uh, uh, not so long ago, uh, the actual um, uh, instigation of Boko Haram here, including the organization, was as a result of politics. Political contest, rivalry, dissatisfaction. But then it got out of hand and rebounded in the faces of those who unleashed Boko Haram on us. Because they employed the um, very volatile uh, motivation of religious extremism. And you never know where religious extremism will take you. Because if you say to people and you unleash them on innocent citizens, and you say, your reason is that the society is not holy enough. There comes a point when those people will turn around and look at you and say, well, come to think of it, you are by no means holy enough. And this is a reality. Go and study the, or remind yourself of what happened in Algeria, in which even uh, uh, the, virtually the entire society was, um, was declared a non-Islamic society because it was not sufficiently Islamic according to that very narrow, convenient interpretation of Islam. So that's why I began by saying that let's always remember that what's happening in Nigeria is not peculiar to Nigeria. My fear is that we are going to end up with the Algerian scenario. In fact, that we have entered the peripheries of the Algerian scenario, which was a bloody, cruel, and uh, absolutely sadistic form of Islamic extremism. You have, a, a, and very often it is unleashed by those seeking political power. The history of Islamic extremism in the Maghreb, in uh, its attempts in Ital Islam, the, 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 the fundamentalism which goes back to what the, what's known as the Quraysh. Uh, for instance, those who want to go back to that very beginning, the, the, the very uh, foundations of a particular uh, strand of Islam. Uh, the, it's, it's, it's a flag, it's like a red flag, which is waved you know, uh, in the face of the raging bull of, uh, uh, of, 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 of intol intolerance. Now, when people have their hands bloodied, once the first killing People will tell you it's always the most difficult. After that, especially if you believe that the killing is associated to rewards in afterlife, then killing becomes not only easier, but pleasurable. So we're dealing not merely with a political issue, we're not dealing not only with a, a religious issue, we're dealing with a psychological condition. And those who talk amnesty should please spell out exactly what they mean by amnesty? Does the type given to the Niger Deltans, the talk that they said? That the, the type given to the militants in the Niger Delta? Well, first of all, uh, let me reveal to you that I uh, actually disagreed with the methodology of that, 
of that uh, uh, amnesty. And I, I, I discussed it with President Jonathan when he uh, came in power. Um, the, there should always be, uh, in giving amnesty, there should always be categorization. You cannot, the same kind of amnesty, when you amnesty crimes, you cannot give the same blanket kind of amnesty to all forms of criminality. Uh, torturers, mass killers, and so on and so forth. There's a different approach which must be taken. You can say, yes, we're now ready to discuss amnesty. We're now ready to discuss amnesty for certain categories of crimes against society. But there are crimes not just against society, but against humanity. As I've stressed again and again, these people have taken up arms, not even against the state, which is what happened with the men in the, in the uh, Southeast. They have taken up arms against humanity. And I see that humanity, whatever their motivation, whatever brainwashing they have received, they have committed crimes against humanity. You don't just blank throughout a blanket amnesty for everybody. But, but, but the world have not seen it that way, that it's uh, taking arms against humanity. Well, that's where I see it. Does it bother you that the world is not? Because up till now, like, like some person say, uh, 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 the militants, some say they're Islamic fundamentalists, and some say, look, they're terrorists. No. But if it's uh, armed against humanity, is that, does that come under militancy or does it come under terrorism? And how do we describe it? Uh, always bear in mind something which Buhari said uh, quite accurately that there are, when people talk about Boko Haram, there are, <laughs> he recognized three kinds of Boko Haram. I think I recognize at least seven to ten types of, of Boko Haram, yes. Um, and, uh, but basically, we're dealing with very sick minds, basically. Either those who will themselves to be sick, who've closed all avenues against humanity, who consider themselves above humanity, and who have given themselves the right to judge, humanity, and to punish humanity. And so even people of their own religion, they look at them and say, ah, you are subhuman, because you do not apply the same standards, the same, you do not put on the same face as I do. On no, 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 Prof, do you think the government has done enough to fight it? Because if we keep having these uh, uh, killings, probably that is the reason why some persons are saying, look, there should be amnesty so that we have for once people lay down their arms because if we keep adopting this military style to deal with it, we may never get it solved. But it's not, even though I criticize the government for not doing enough, that in fairness to the government, it's not merely military, you know, approach that is being used. The, at the very beginning, if you remember, recognizing where these kids, the shirtless, are brainwashed, a reformation, a policy of reformation of the al Majuri schools, of the madrasas, began. So that doesn't receive as much notice, uh, attention, as the, milita uh, the uh, militarist uh, approach. And yet, you cannot avoid the militarist approach. Society must be protected. You must be protected. I must be protected. Issue. Beg your pardon? It's complicating the issue. What is complicating the issue? That society is being protected? I, 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 I mean, are you saying that we, society, human beings, that university lecturers, that school pupils, uh, that workers, that uh, in the uh, United uh, Nations uh, uh, headquarters should not be protected? Are you saying that peasants, farmers, in the mar bringing their wares to the markets should be blown up without any response in kind? But, but Prof, the, the, some of the leaders in the North see it as the military terrorizing the people because recently when the, the president visited uh, um, Borno State, they, they, they told him that, look, you don't need the military. You see, there are two distinct issues. And that's why some of us are human rights advocates. We believe in the rights even of those who are being accused. And we believe that the military must have and be compelled to follow the security forces must have and must be compelled to follow a code, a very strict code of ethics in their dealing with people. So if the military or the security forces uh, commit any excessive and illegal acts, they must be brought to order. The two things are not contradictory at all. 
We're saying, on the one hand, nobody has a right to declare themselves judges and executioners over humanity. But then the same rule applies also to the military. You don't just sweep people up and make them disappear overnight. Up till now, we don't even know who killed those 60 bodies which were found you know, responsible for 60-something bodies in the river. And we must get to the bottom of it and punish those who are responsible. I strongly suspect it's security forces, for instance. And such a thing should not be swept, should not just be buried like that. So let us be very clear in our minds about the responsibilities of security forces. But you cannot say that the security forces should not operate. If you say so, that's fine with me. I will go where I can get arms, and I will begin to protect myself and my family, and my colleagues, and my friends, and any other person who wants to come under my protection. Then we'll have a series of private armies. But we contribute money to security forces, your tax, you know, and other forms of contribution, just so that we can go about our legitimate business. We can pay taxes so that children can go to school without being blown up. We contribute money, taxes, etc., so that farmers can bring their crops safely and trade their crops, not be blown up in a bus for wanting to pursue their you know, petty trading. These are ordinary persons. These are not elite. These are not the ordinary citizen, ordinary individual. In other words, humanity is under siege. Just, just a last question. The, 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 the African Union uh, is celebrating the, its 50th anniversary since it was created, Organization of African Unity. Do you think this international, uh, uh, this regional body has done enough? I, I don't. I, I want to give Africa Union a little bit more uh, uh, a room uh, to expand its zones of responsibilities and to intensify the, uh, the, the, the processes of fulfilling the responsibilities. Africa Union didn't do too badly in Somalia, for instance. You have to remember that. African Union is reacting more rapidly to issues of dictatorship, which wants to rear its head after Africa has pronounced it dead and buried, or on its way to the grave. Uh, and there are certain organizations for the elevation of uh, um, uh, uh, poverty. Uh, you know, so there are certain schemes that I happen to know about which are very well thought out. But we still have the problem of rogue leadership you know, among the club. Uh, and one should expect that. So let's see in which direction uh, Africa Union evolves. But I'm convinced that especially since the time of uh, Traore, the former Secretary General of the OU, uh, what's his name now, uh, I've, I've noticed a change in, in, uh, in volition, in direction, in uh, a self-conscious uh, awareness of the burden of responsibility on the members to push up the African continent into into the present century, a little bit belatedly. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, if a former militant, uh, uh, Henry Oka, just got a sentence uh, uh, far away in South Africa. He's a Nigerian, got a sentence in South Africa. What is your take on this? Well, I, I, as you just heard, I deplore terrorism. Uh, I deplore even uh, kidnapping, kidnapping for ransom, even however much you believe in a cause. And I'm not just saying this, at the time of the men, when the kidnapping began, I publicly denounced kidnapping. So how much more blowing up of innocence? There are, there are wars of liberation which have been fought all over the world, in which the uh, philosophy is confrontation with the state rather than confrontation with humanity. And I believe that any act of terrorism, you know, and terrorism is very clearly defined, an act of terrorism is a crime against humanity. Thank you so much, Prof, for coming on my show today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Now, you've had it all from Professor Wale Shoinka. I guess you did enjoy every bit of this interview. Until we come your way again next week on the same platform, Straight Talk, my name remains Shomomo Imodu. Bye-bye.